Hello, my name is Sean Boyle and I teach at the Southern Illinois University Automotive Technology Program and this video is going to cover the Mercedes 722.6 electronics. It's also known as the NAG transmission found in common Jeep and Chrysler and Dodge vehicles. Now if you don't already know this is kind of part of a series where I've covered the, now I'm covering the electronics, but I've covered the mechanical, the hydraulics, the complete overhaul, and there's even a video on the enhancements and improvements that the aftermarket has created specifically for the valve body. So be sure to check those out. You can find those at automotivetextbook.com when you click on the automatic transmission curriculum link, or you could just look here on the YouTube and uh, find it uh, under the automatic transmissions playlist. Let's look at a simplified electrical schematic for one of these Chrysler vehicles. This is, I believe, off of a, a 300C. You can see up top there, I've got listed the transmission control module, TCM, and then this is the transmission. It's code there, the W5A580. Uh, that indicates it's the larger of the transmissions. There's the W5A330 as well. And we have our various inputs and outputs listed right here, and it shows its connection to the transmission. Kind of going down the list, right here we've got the speed sensor supply. Six volts actually feed the speed sensors the N2 and the N3 speed sensors, they feed at six volts. Now those are Hall effect sensors. You can see they've got a ground going right back to the computer. So on these two sensor wires here, and we'll learn a little bit more about these two speed sensors in a bit, but these two sensors here will create a digital square wave pattern based off the input shaft speed. Uh, the N2, they need two of them. They're both input shaft speed sensors because the N2 speed sensor actually won't read anything in first and fifth gear. It'll only read input shaft speed in second, third, and fourth. So they use the N3 speed sensor for first and fifth. And why can't they use it all the time? It was because the part that the N3 speed sensor reads off of is actually gonna be working in a gear reduction um, while operating in uh, first and fifth. So it's not a true input shaft speed rotation. It's kind of a calculated. And then going down a little bit further, we've got, that was the ground for the speed sensors, also the ground for the temp sensor. Right here we see temp sensor signal. And we follow that over and we've got our oil temp sensor and kind of locate just before our oil temp sensor is the park neutral switch. It's an actual switch that's located on the valve body and they've, we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second here too on a separate little uh, topic. But that park neutral switch is gonna be combined with that temp sensor circuit. So that way when we're in park in neutral, the, set, the temp sensor circuit will actually be opened up. So it'll read full five volts. And the computer will say, oh, I'm on open circuit on the temp sensor circuit. And it'll say, well, I must be in park in neutral. And then when it's reading a temperature like you'd find in reverse or in the drive ranges, it knows that I must not be in park in neutral. So that's how they use a park neutral switch kind of built into the temp sensor circuit. And then these right here are solenoid circuits. You can see we've got our shift solenoid, our two, three shift solenoid, our three, uh, three, four shift solenoid, the one, two slash four, five shift solenoids down here. And then this right here is our shift pressure solenoid and our torque converter clutch solenoid, PWM solenoid. And then where it says module solenoid out right here, that's our line pressure solenoid. So we've got our six solenoids that we got in this transmission right here. The power supply comes in, so we deliver our 12 volts. They go through the coils and the solenoids in the transmission. They find their way back to the TCM and the TCM controls the ground. We'll look at those solenoids here a little bit. And then down here is our shift lever assembly. The way they incorporate that into the operation of this transmission is it communicates to the CAN bus, to the TCM, what our shift lever position is at. So if we're in park, neutral, reverse, drive, it basically lets the computer know through the CAN bus. It's not a hardwired uh, circuit. It broadcasts it through the CAN bus. So it's a module in itself and it is part of the network. This image right here pretty much shows the conductor plate that's the component, the electrical component that sits on top of the valve body. And right there in the middle, we can have our two speed sensors. They're input shaft speed sensors, the N2 and N3. You might be wondering, where's the N1 speed sensor? Well, that is the crankshaft position sensor. So it's really the engine um, component. Now right here is our pass-through connector. That's what allows us to connect the vehicle harness. There's a little adapter that fits in there, and then that kind of connects to the, uh, the conductor plate there. So there's a little adapter that fits in between the outside world and the inside world of, as far as the transmission is concerned. These two solenoids here, there's our line pressure and shift pressure solenoids. These are identical, same part number. Uh, probably want to keep those in the same spots, but they are interchangeable if you got them mixed up. The one, two slash four, five, the three, four, 
and the two three shift solenoids, those are also the same part number and they could fit in the, their different spots. The lockup solenoid, it is a solenoid of itself. It's not like any of these others. So um, it won't fit in any of the other spots. Now our thermistor, our temp sensor is right down there. And you probably can't see it in this image, but there's a little push button right there, and that's the park neutral safety switch. Looking at this valve body and the electronics, they're held down by these little straps. So you use a T27, Torx, and you can pull these straps off. That pushes the solenoids down into their uh, conductor port. And then the solenoids come out. You wiggle them around a little bit. There's that one, it's a shift solenoid. These are my shift solenoids right here. My pressure control solenoids. That one's got some tight O-rings. Torque converter clutch PWM solenoid. If I take this conductor plate off, it kind of has a little tab over here by the, uh, by the temp sensor. Kind of fights you a little bit trying to get it off. But looking at that conductor plate, there's our temperature, our thermistor right there. This is the park neutral switch that opens up that temp sensor circuit. The conductor plate here has these kind of copper connections and these, and these little spades that are kind of built into the uh, solenoids. They get kind of pushed into those copper connections by the straps that are above it. And like I said, those are speed sensor. You want to make sure when you rebuild these things, it definitely change the O-ring seals on these because they have a tendency to shrink. Now this slide right here shows the resistances of the different solenoids. You can see all of our shift solenoids, because they are the same, they are four ohms. And the torque converter clutch solenoid, it's the lowest at two and a half ohms. And then our, two, our shift pressure and our line pressure solenoid, they're five ohms. So they're all low resistance. They're all pulse width modulated. Now you're going to see that the shift solenoids, even though they are pulse width modulated, they're pulse width modulated not to control the pressure, but it's to control the current flow through it. So that way we're not pulling three amps. If we just turn it on, we'd be pulling about three amps through it, maybe a little more. Um, but they pulse width modulate these things to limit current flow through it. I've got a little description that's found in the, the training information that we have on it. And it says the shift solenoids are initially pulsed for 60 milliseconds pretty much full on. Now you're gonna see in these scope images that I've got later in this presentation that they're actually not pulse on at 99.6%. It's closer to like 78%, but they're only doing it for about 60 milliseconds. So just a little burst of energy to get the solenoid to move. And then afterward they pulse them between 25 and 37%. So that's the current limiting uh, function of it. And the average current is between a half of an amp and a full amp. So Really, I just want to point that out because it is pretty amazing what they do as far as these electronics are concerned on the computer side of things. It's not just turning a solenoid on and off. It's pulse with modulating it. There's a lot of uh, programming and hardware and circuitry involved to control the current flow through these solenoids and to get the solenoids to react like they want. This table right here shows pretty much what's happening to all the solenoids while you're upshifting. You can see first, first, second, 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 and third, and so forth. And then the next slide has it while you're downshifting. And the reason why I'm really trying to show you this slide here is because the shift solenoids, when you're in a gear, look at first, there's first there, second, third, kind of going down the line. The shift solenoids are off. They leave the shift solenoids off when you're in a gear. The only time the shift solenoids turn on is when you're commanding a shift and during that transition phase. So the way they have this designed, and if you look up there at this link, I'm gonna tag that. That's the hydraulics presentation. It explains how they're doing it. They have four valves per shift group, and the shift groups are these three right here, the one, two, four, five, the three, four, and the two, three. There are four valves for each of those. There's a command valve, a holding valve, an overlap valve, and a shift pressure valve. And those four valves are gonna control and apply and release of a clutch. And they're doing that by the command coming initially from the solenoid, moving a command valve over. So that's what these solenoids do. That's why when you see like first to second, one of the, the one, two slash four, five solenoid turns on. And then when you're in second to third, the two, three solenoid turns on right there. And third to fourth, the three, four solenoid turns on. Fourth to fifth, the one, two, three, the one, two, four, five solenoid turns back on again. 
They only have to turn those solenoids on for about two and a half seconds. That gets the whole process going, the shift completes, and then they can turn the solenoid back off. The same is gonna hold true for the downshifts. If I'm downshifting, I still energize the one, two, slash four, five, but instead of going from fourth to fifth, it's gonna be going from fifth to fourth. And the four, three, instead of from going from third to fourth, it's gonna be going from fourth to third. So they just energize that solenoid again to get the downshift to occur. It's really brilliant. I mean, the way they've designed this uh, valve body and these electronics is very impressive. So even though I have a separate hydraulics presentation, we really need to cover hydraulics because the electronics are responsible for hydraulic control. These electronic solenoids are taking oil pressure and making valves do something in the valve body. So kind of combine both of these. The hydraulics presentation really covers how they're achieving the shift quality and the shift pressures at the clutches. Whereas this, I'm gonna be looking at primarily what happens to the pressures that the solenoids themselves are controlling. So uh, that's a little disclaimer. But our line pressure solenoid and our shift pressure solenoid are all gonna be fed a reduced pressure. Now I do have a video up here on solenoid regulator valves. It's such an important valve in the transmission. I created a separate video on it. It's not just this transmission, it's for pretty much any transmission. But in this case, according to the literature, it supplies about 125 PSI to the shift solenoid valve and the line pressure valve. And you're gonna look down here, this is that valve right here. So it's fed with line pressure. Line pressure then gets reduced down to, you know, and really it might not get reduced, but it's gonna be allowed to have a maximum of 125 PSI. If pressures in the transmission are only 100 PSI, well that full 100 PSI is gonna find its way into this green circuit. But if pressures get elevated and they go above 125 PSI, once it lets that pressure in, it's kind of sampling that pressure right there on the end of it, on that reaction end. And eventually, if pressures go above 125 PSI, it's gonna move that valve over and you can see what it does. It cuts itself off, it doesn't allow any more in. That's all determined by that spring right there. So if you take a look where that green fluid pressure goes, it finds its way up to the shift pressure regulator solenoid or the shift pressure solenoid, finds its way over to the line pressure solenoid. And it also finds its way over to the shift solenoid regulator pressure. We're gonna cover that one here in a second. That takes the pressure and knocks it down even further for the lockup solenoid and the shift solenoids. So now looking just at the line pressure solenoid, that green pressure that came from our solenoid reduction valve, the LP solenoid in, which is basically like I said, a solenoid regulator valve, that fluid comes up to our pressure regulator valve for line pressure, and it delivers that pressure depending on how that solenoid's operated. If they have the solenoid turned on, it's a normally passing solenoid. So if they have that solenoid electrically on, it actually blocks all that off, doesn't let anything through. If they de-energize the solenoid, it lifts the pintle up and it lets fluid in. And if you look, that fluid finds its way over to the end of this valve, and that's the regulator valve, the line pressure regulator valve. This is what creates the overall pressure in this transmission. So those little dots that you see right there, as far as the line pressure regulator valve is concerned, that's a spring. So the way it works is here's our oil pump. You can see it's a gear and crescent type pump, just a positive displacement pump. It's gonna rotate, the torque converter is gonna be driving, it's gonna rotate, it's gonna generate pressure. And that pressure that builds up, it's gonna push on the end of this valve. And it's also gonna go through and feed all the circuits that needs to feed in the, in the um, transmission. And this passageway up here gets into this area. This section, this pass-through right here feeds the torque converter. We'll look at that completely different. Matter of fact, I got a separate video on torque converter operation in this transmission, but let's focus on how that line pressure solenoid can regulate pressure in this transmission. So as pressure builds up in this transmission, it's gonna end up eventually pushing this valve over to the left as we see and compressing the spring and pushing out any of that fluid that's in there. Once it moves far enough, it opens up into this purple passage and you follow this purple passage around, it finds its way right back to the inlet of the pump. So if this opens up right here, if that passageway opens up, we basically aren't gonna generate any more pressure. We're gonna bleed off any pressure, excessive pressure above that predetermined amount and just dump it right back into the intake. Uh, once, they opened, once they open the pressure side up to the inlet side, it can't pump anymore. And now what if I want more pressure? If I didn't have the ability of changing my line pressure through this, uh, or this, the line pressure solenoid, if this was just a normal pressure regulator with a spring, kind of like that, the solenoid regulator valve, it would just be the spring. Once it overcame that spring force, it would go to its regulating point and then it'd be done. But what they do here now, and this is pretty common amongst most transmissions, 
is they can take this solenoid and as they de-energize the solenoid and that fluid pressure gets behind this valve, it works with the spring. So instead of having just a constant tension from that spring, we're gonna have the spring tension and any additional pressure that my pressure regulator um, solenoid or my pressure solenoid, line pressure solenoid added to that circuit. So our minimum pressure in this transmission is gonna be determined just by the spring, but how high the pressure can go is gonna be determined by the spring and that fluid force right there. So in this case, it can go as high as 320 PSI is what they have it listed out as. And this table right here shows the pressure and current relationship. So if I don't have that solenoid turned on at all, I'm gonna let basically, let's just say 110 PSI, that's the upper limit, that's the lower limit, but we're gonna let 110 PSI work on that regulator valve. So not only does line pressure have to compress the spring, but it has to also overcome that 110 P PSI, pounds per square inch of pressure. And then as they turn the solenoid on, all the way up to 1,000 milliamps or one amp, then we're dealing with just maybe zero to maybe five PSI at most. So when it's turned on, it doesn't let anything through. When it's turned off, it lets that regulated line pressure. Going back a slide, it's gonna let that solenoid pressure find its way all the way through and kind of join on the back of that regulator valve. That's how that line pressure solenoid works and that's how this pressure regulator works in a nutshell. So that shift pressure solenoid is gonna work in a similar fashion. It's gonna take our solenoid regulator fluid and it's gonna modify that to this blue fluid. And if you find it back around, it works on our, sol our shift pressure regulator valve. And our shift pressure regulator valve, that's the pressure that's gonna find its way to all these clutches. And uh, every time we shift, we're gonna see the shift pressure regulator valve is gonna be responsible for applying the clutch and also helping through the valving uh, release the releasing clutch. So what it's gonna do is that solenoid, same scenario, because they're identical solenoids, so it's a normally passing solenoid. So if it's electrically off, it's letting full 125 PSI through there. And if it's on, it's gonna prevent anything from coming through it. So if they turn that thing off, or the more they electrically turn it off, the more it's gonna work on this end of the valve, and that's the reaction end. Line pressure coming straight from a pump, all in that red right there, finds its way right up into there. And that line pressure is gonna find its way into this dark blue circuit, that's the regulating circuit. And when this builds up high enough, it's gonna block off its uh, passageway there. Well, if they want more shift pressure, what would they do? The more they turn the shift pressure solenoid off, the more shift pressure solenoid uh, pressure works on the end of this valve and moves the valve over to the right, and that lets more line pressure in until it could build up enough pressure back here to close itself off again. So the valve's always gonna live in this point where it's pretty much just uncovering this line pressure to shift pressure passage. It's similar with the line pressure regulator. It's always gonna be working where this line pressure uh, passageway is always gonna just, just be uncovering that uh, release to the sump. I know it's not drawn here, but hopefully you understand what I'm talking about. So the shift pressure regulator is gonna be operating between zero and 220 PSI the way they have it designed. That if I don't have any assist from the shift pressure solenoid, it's not gonna take anything hardly to come in and close that valve off. And then the more assist I give it with the shift pressure solenoid, the more the pressure that's in there has to overcome the shift pressure solenoid pressure to close itself off. And that's the 220 PSI. So now looking at the shift solenoids and the torque converter clutch solenoid, they don't need that 125 PSI to operate. So they actually knock the pressure down even again to about 50 to 55 PSI is what they have listed in their specs. So, you know, they've got the line pressure coming up to our solenoid regulator valve and that green pressure comes through, feeds our shift pressure solenoid, our line pressure solenoid. But if you look, it also comes up here to this SS Sol in, which is a shift solenoid regulator valve. And it's gonna take it and modify it to this yellow pressure. That's where the 50 to 55 PSI comes into play. It only, the, depending on this spring force right here, it's only gonna let about 50 to 55 PSI in there, and that's gonna end up feeding my shift solenoids, my lockup solenoid, and you know, so I got three shift solenoids and a lockup solenoid receiving 50 to 55 PSI. So as I said before, the shift solenoids turn on for just a couple seconds. The service information says it turns on for about one and a half seconds. My scope images show it at about two and a half seconds. So we'll average it out. Say so it's, they turn them on for about two seconds. And when these solenoids energize, they open up and the pressure that leaves them is gonna go over to the command valve to initiate a shift. I mentioned this just a briefly before, but once again, the hydraulic video 
covers what's happening during shifts, but the command valve starts it all. And the solenoid, when it energizes, it shuttles the command valve, and that starts this whole process of releasing a clutch and applying a clutch. So if you want to learn more about that, watch that hydraulic lecture. But yeah, so we got our three shift solenoids and our lockup solenoid, and they are normally closed, and when they energize them, they let pressure go through it, and they're gonna let anywhere, well, the shift solenoids are gonna let 50 PSI go through it to shuttle the command valve, and then the lockup solenoid, because it's pulsed modulated, it's going to modulate and let what pressure it needs to to get the torque converter clutch apply feel that we need. Once again, I got a separate torque converter video that focuses primarily on that. Whoa, who's this guy? Oh, he's getting ready to check some solenoids, loosening up, cracking the knuckles. It's always good to warm up first. Checking his meter leads together. He's got a pretty good, you know, tenth of an ohm there. Nothing, no problem there, zero. You've got to take that into consideration if you're measuring the resistance of these parts. Make sure your leads aren't causing some of it. First, he's checking that lockup solenoid there. Two and a half ohms, couldn't ask for anything better than that. Right on the money. Next here is the shift pressure or the lockup solenoid. Five ohms, right in the money. Couldn't ask for anything better than that either. And lastly, looks like he's got one of them there shift solenoids. And four ohms, perfect. Textbook, right on the money. It's what they're supposed to be. So those test the coils for resistance, but do the solenoids physically actuate or move? Now he's energizing. Whoa, and he's blowing air through it, taking it a step further. Oh, having a little bit of fun with it. Well, that one's pretty good. That's a shift solenoid. He's making a beat there. I like this guy. Oh, there's the thumbs up for the uh, PWM solenoid for the lockup. And, oh, he's struggling. Can't get the hose over the end of that line pressure solenoid. I oh, made an adapter. How about that? How persnickety. Slide the hose over the end of that and energizer. This guy should be in a band. Like a DJ over here. Mix master Sean. Now those tests aren't completely conclusive. Uh, yes, they check to make sure the resistance, there's no shorts or openings in the winding. Uh, we also check to make sure they can pass so that the pintle itself is physically moving in there and that's great. But what they don't check is the pressure versus duty cycle relationship. It doesn't go through all the different heat ranges and the heat cycles, if they're leaking or you know not, not doing their job. So we can see if they're failures, like overall failures, like an open or a short, or a pintle that's stuck, or a, a pintle that won't close or won't open, but we can't check to see if they're flowing properly, especially that torque converter solenoid and that shift pressure and line pressure solenoid. But if it's all you got to work with, then it's not a bad test to do at all. Now, if you're the type of person that digs into things and stares at them for a long time, kind of like I do, you might have looked at this shift pressure solenoid or this line pressure solenoid and kind of tried to figure out how it works. It seemed to do the opposite when we air tested than you expected. You would think that would be flowing a ton of air when, you're, when it's de-energized, and then when you energize it, it would trap it off. But that's the exact opposite of what happened. It wasn't flowing much. It was flowing a little bit, but it wasn't flowing much. And then when I energized it, you heard, Psh! it was blasting a lot of air through it. So that makes you stop, and you're like, wait a minute. This is supposed to open up when it's off and trap when it's energized. So what's actually happening? When looking at this valve body, you can see that the pressure going to the shift pressure and line pressure solenoids they don't really have many places to go. There's no other passageways, no holes drilled. So when you look at the solenoid itself, you can see the fluid pressure can come in through the tip and then find its way out through the sides. And then inside that valve body, you can see that there are these openings around there. So really everything just gets exhausted out. So when they energize the solenoid, they just end up leaking all that fluid pressure out, and then it can't find its way to the regulator valve. Then as they de-energize the solenoid, it ends up trapping that fluid pressure in these circuits here, and that ends up working on the ends of their regulator valve. So you might be like, wait a minute, how can they do that? How can they get away with that? They bleed off the pressure in the circuit. So the answer lies in our spacer plate. 
The spacer plate lives between the valve body halves. It contains a bunch of holes, including orifices. Orifices are the small holes that really just are there to regulate fluid flow, how quickly fluid can flow through these circuits. And if you look, they've identified a couple of these here as the ones that are used for the line pressure solenoid circuit and the shift pressure solenoid circuit. So looking at this hydraulic schematic here, you can see on the bottom I've got my solenoid regulator pressure feeding these two solenoids, the shift pressure solenoid and the line pressure solenoid. If you take a look, I got these sideways V's going here. And what are those representing? You got it? They're representing orifices, orifices that we have in the spacer plate. And what function do they serve? That might be something that you're asking yourself. Well, the operation of the solenoid, if you remember when I was air testing them, you, when I energized it, you heard more air coming out of the solenoid. Matter of fact, I was, had it de-energized, you heard a little bit of leakage, and then when I put 12 volts to it, you heard a ton of leakage. So you're like, wait a minute, that's kind of the opposite of what I was expecting. But actually, the way they have this design, that is the way that they are intending for this to work. Because think of what's going to happen. All that fluid from my solenoid regulator is going to squeeze through this orifice. Now, if I bleed all of that off when the solenoid is turned on electrically, none of that fluid pressure is going to find its way to work on this pressure regulator valve. The only thing the pressure regulator valve is going to have to overcome is the spring, and that's going to be the minimum line pressure. Now, as I de-energize the solenoid and I'm not leaking out as much, the fluid pressure, instead of bleeding out, is going to find its way over work on the end of the regulator valve, and then boost line pressure, because line pressure is going to have to overcome not only the spring, but that additional force. So it is functioning a little bit different than a typical hydraulic circuit. I figured I'd mention this because the way these hydraulic schematics are drawn, it's not very clear that that's how these solenoids work. Looking at this valve body and going back and talking about the temp sensor and the park neutral position switch there, uh, here's a little, just kind of the, about the simplest wiring schematic you can get. This, is, this would be the TCM here, and that's the transmission. And normally on a temp sensor circuit, you're going to have 5 volts. So you're going to have 5 volts going through a, a dropping resistor. Uh, so it'll be 5 volts through a resistor. Then right after the resistor, the TCM has the ability of checking the voltage, and that voltage is going to correspond to a temperature. So imagine we got the 5 volts coming through a dropping resistor, sensed right afterward, it dropped voltage and it, let's say, it has two volts left on the circuit here. Uh, then it goes up to the thermistor and the other two volts are dropped and finds its way to ground. Now, one thing that's interesting about this thermistor is it's a PTC, or positive temperature coefficient. And what that means is as temperature increases, the resistance increases. That's the opposite of what we typically see in a car with the intake air temp, transmission fluid temp, engine coolant temp, and other various temp sensors. Usually they're NTC negative temperature coefficient, which means as the temperature increases, resistance decreases. So they do things a little bit different here, but it really doesn't make a difference. We're still going to be sharing that voltage between the fixed resistor in the TCM with the thermistor in the transmission. Whatever voltage is left on this line right here is going to be interpreted as a transmission temperature. So it just does it opposite. As the temperature increases, this resistance is going to increase and the voltage is going to climb as far as the temperature sensor signal circuit. But the neat thing about this design is that little switch right there is the park neutral switch. So the computer is going to go ahead and interpret an open temp sensor circuit as the transmission being in park or neutral. So when you place the transmission in park and neutral, physically the linkage opens that, pushes in on a switch, a little push button switch, and that opens that circuit up right there. And then now, since I've got five volts going through that resistor, but it can't find a path to ground, I've got volt, 5 volts built up on this whole circuit here. And the computer is going to read that because it senses it right after the, the um, resistor. It's going to sense that 5 volts and determine I got an open circuit. I'm not passing any current. There's no voltage drop. I have an open circuit, so I must be, using the logic that I've been programmed with, I must be in park or neutral. So that's the way they do that. It's pretty simple. That's the thermistor. There's a wire going down, that thermistor is sitting deep into the pan. It's part, you know, the pan's pretty shallow anyway, but... And then the button is right there, like if I were pushing on it, that's the button, and that will open the circuit up. So on these next few screens here, I've got scope images. And these two images right here, you're seeing this nice pulse with modulated pattern. That is showing the frequency of our line pressure and our shift pressure solenoids. You can see that they are operating about 1,000 hertz. Now, this one right here up top, it's, I'm going to guess, I didn't put that down there, um, but 
I'm gonna guess that that is working at about a 20% or 30% duty cycle. Remember when we're checking this, I'm checking on the ground side of the solenoid. I'm not checking power to it because these are ground switch. If you remember on the schematic, we had 12 volts feeding all the solenoids and then the computer controlled the grounds of each. So that means I have to T-pin into the ground side circuit. So if I saw 12 volts on any of these things, flat lined, I've got no current flowing through it. The computer did not provide a ground. So I've got 12 volts up through the solenoid and on that wire going to the computer. Now, as soon as I provide a ground, as soon as the computer provides a ground, it's gonna pull that voltage down because the voltage is gonna drop across the solenoid in the transmission. And I'll have zero volts on the wire between the transmission and the computer because all the voltage was dropped by the solenoid. So when you're trying to think of uh, how much on time the solenoid has, you actually look to see how much time it's spending on the ground side of things, not on the power side of things. Power means it's off, ground means it's on. When it's at zero, it means it's on, and when it's at 12, that it means it's off. So like here, for example, we see hardly any time at the zero spot, and it's mostly hanging out at the 12 volt spot, so that means it's off most of the time. So this thing might only be pulse with modulated um, on maybe like just like 5%, it's hardly turned on at all. Now this scope image here shows our shift solenoids, a big old blocks, big blue block, big gold block. I'm gonna zoom in on this in a second. This right here is one of our shift solenoids. I think it was the one, two, four, five, I remember. And if you measure the length of time that that solenoid turned on, remember these solenoids only turn on usually for a couple seconds. Up there, it says the delta of that is about two and a half seconds. So that's where I got my two and a half seconds. I know the published literature says one and a half, but you can see both of these are about two and a half seconds in length. Now to zoom in on it, you could see the beginning portion of that. This is the first 60 milliseconds they say, and that's about what I'm getting, about 55 milliseconds is what's shown up there. But the amount of time it spends at zero volts, which means it's electrically on, is pretty high. Uh, the duty cycle is 17.2%. So 17.2% of the time, it's high voltage. So the opposite of that is how much time it's spending on the ground, and the opposite of that would be how much time it's actually energized. Hopefully you understand that. I kind of explained that just a second ago, but I know it's maybe not perfectly clear. And I said earlier on it was 78%, I was guessing, but looking at this right here, we're actually closer to 83% on time, but it's still far away from what they state in their training information. In the training information, they state that it's on like 99.6% of the time for the first 60 milliseconds. That's not the case in reality. It's more like 83%-ish. Uh, and then after that uh, first 60 milliseconds or so, they do pulse with modulate mainly for uh, current control. It, so it shows here that they're actually pulsed here at 26% on time. This says 74 because remember it's measuring how much time it's spending at 12 volts. And the only time that they, I sound like a broken record here, but the, when the solenoid is energized is when it's at zero. So if it's saying 75 or 74% of the time it's at 12 volts, that means 26% of the time it's energized and the voltage is at zero volts. So this slide right here covers the input speed sensors. I got the two speed sensors, N2 and N3. They're both fed with six volts. If I look at this scope image right here, you can see I'm toggling both of them between six volts and zero. They're Hall effect sensors, so if I zoomed in, it'd be a nice square wave pattern. The, uh, they'll show a nice square wave pattern, but the computer is gonna really look at the frequency of that, how fast it's switching and that's how it can figure out how fast the input shaft is going. And if you also remember, they need two of them because one of them, the N2, is measuring off the K1 clutch housing, which is the front sun gear, but that's being held by the B1 clutch when you're in first and fifth and also one of the reverse options. So during those phases, when you're in first or fifth or during the normal reverse option, you actually have to measure off of this N3 speed sensor, which is gonna be measuring off the front carrier slash rear internal gear assembly and they'll calculate it. They'll have to calculate it because that front carrier rear internal gear assembly is gonna be spinning at a gear reduction when you're in the normal reverse, first gear and fifth gear. But yeah, you'll see a nice square wave pattern from your Hall effect sensors, six volts to zero volts. They'll count the frequency of it to figure out how fast it's going. And I've got my two speed sensors, the N2 and the N3, N1 being the crankshaft on the engine. So here dealing with the transmission, I got my N2 and my N3 speed sensor and they're gonna create a nice, beautiful square wave. The frequency of it is gonna be related to the input shaft speed. 
Now, they actually have had issues with these speed sensors failing. This is all part of this conductor plate. This conductor plate is a big old chunk of plastic that allows for connections with the solenoids, and it has these kind of speed sensors built into it. And there's, they don't, like this can't unplug. You can't replace this by itself. So if you run into speed sensor issues, you just have to replace this whole little conductor plate. Now you might have noticed when we looked at the electrical schematic that there was no input for an output shaft speed sensor. So what do they use for the output shaft? They rely on the analog brake system to report wheel speed sensors. So the wheel speed sensor information or input is going to be broadcasted out to the modules and the transmission control module is going to use that to determine how fast the vehicle is going so it could shift properly. Well, here's the kicker. If you've got one wheel speed sensor code in there, this transmission is likely going to go into default and not upshift. Even though it could read off the others, it still determines if it's got ABS code, especially related to a wheel speed sensor, it's not going to trust the information and it's going to put you in lint mode. So whenever you work on one of these transmissions, if you've got a no upshift complaint, Definitely check the codes in other modules. Don't just focus on the transmission control module. Look at analog brake, look at PCM. Make sure your CAN bus has the ability to communicate between all these different modules because it relies heavily, especially on the analog brake control module. Also, don't forget to check to see if there's a flash update for your TCM. You're gonna find there's a lot of problems that can be solved with a simple software flash. Like here's a P0730 with transmission shift enhancements. It applies to these vehicles. Now, I only pulled this up as an example. So if you have a shift issue, definitely go and check your service information. Make sure there's not a flash up there that will help cure that problem. This slide right here is a recording from a Snap-on Scan tool. Now, I tried to keep this as clear as possible. I've got a lot of things. The vehicle that we were, I was pulling this off of, unfortunately, was not running, so I couldn't get a lot of live action of you know, input shaft speeds and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just showing you some of the data PIDs that are available. Like, for example, right over here, we've got temperature sensor voltage. And you can see when I was in park and in neutral, when I was shifting between those ranges, it was at 5 volts. So once I shifted that transmission into reverse and then into drive, you could see the voltage drop right down to 1.235, and it was actually measuring a transmission temperature at that point. And this uh, PID says, OK to crank. So it's going to be the information that says, hey, I'm in park and neutral. It's OK to crank the engine over. You can see it's true as long as it's reading 5 volts, and you can see it's false as long as it's reading a normal transmission temperature. So that's showing you that the neutral safety switch is tied to that temp sensor circuit. So this right here is also worth noting. Notice how they've got these two pits, shift pressure and then modulation pressure. Modulation pressure would basically be line pressure. These are the commands that the computer is giving. It's kind of basically telling you what it's commanding as far as pressure is concerned but is not an actual reading. This is not what you're getting out of the transmission. There's no way to check that. Uh, there's no pressure tap, so you can verify it. And if you look at the valve body, there's no pressure sensors. So the valve body is not reporting on that pressure. This is just the command what the computer wants. Now, it might be helpful to determine if you're getting harsh shifts, and for some reason this seems a lot higher than it should be. Maybe there's an input somewhere telling this transmission to command higher and uh, harder shifts, higher pressures. These right here are my speed sensors. I got my two speed sensors, uh, speed sensor one, and then right next to it, they call it N2, and then speed sensor two, which right next to it, they call it N3, so to hopefully not confuse you. And then they will tell you what your input shaft speed is. So this is gonna be what the sensors are reporting, and then this is gonna take into consideration the calculation that needed to be done when you're operating first, fifth, or the normal reverse. And then output speed RPM. Now this is not coming from the transmission. This is going to be coming from a wheel speed sensor. So these three PIDs right here are mainly do, uh, related to our torque converter. We got the duty cycle, the percent, so it gives you an idea of how hard they're trying to apply this torque converter clutch. The slip, the desired and the actual slip. So the desired slip is the slip that they want. Let's say they command 50 RPM slip. So the engine speed and the input shaft speed should only be fit within 50 RPM of each other. The actual slip will take into consideration. This is what I measured on my engine speed. This is what I measured on my input shaft speed. And this is what we're getting. So if they're desiring 50, but the actual is 100 and the duty cycle is really high, you know it's fighting to try to get that slip to get reduced. And that's kind of an indication of a problem. Current gear, if you're wondering what gear you're in, first, second, third, or fourth as you're upshifting, driving down the road. And then lastly, I've got my four wheel speed sensors. Remember that those wheel speed sensors that information is coming from the ABS module. 
And it is very important to the operation of this transmission because that's what it pulls vehicle speed from and figures out when to shift this transmission. Without it, even without one, you're gonna likely be in a limp mode and only have one gear, your default gear. Another thing you're gonna find on the snap-on scan tool is there's gonna be a couple options for uh, resetting your learned adaptive. So it's gonna learn how this vehicle's being driven and it'll adapt to it so that way it can provide the smoothest shift. It could store some learned adaptives. And then this is interesting, it says initialize EGS. You're gonna need to do that if you change the transmission control module. Uh, the rest of the vehicle's modules are expecting certain information from the transmission control module. If you put a different transmission control module in there, it's gonna be a calibration issue, a mismatch, and you're gonna to have to go through this initialized EGS to basically teach the other modules the new transmission control module. And that's likely the DTC that it would set, a 1644, it says incorrect variant slash configuration. The service information gives you a little wiring schematic of the parts, but under the theory of operation, it talks about when you put a new TCM in there, it must be learned by the other modules, and you go through the initialize EGS function on the scan tool. So that finishes up this video on the electronic operation of the Mercedes 722.6 transmission, or the Chrysler NAG, however you want to refer to it. And don't forget that there are the other videos up there on the mechanical operation, hydraulic operation, torque converter clutch controls and operation, overhaul, and then the aftermarket improvements and enhancements. So there's pretty comprehensive coverage of the 722.6 transmission. It's up there on automotivetextbook.com under the automatic transmissions curriculum link. It's also found right here on YouTube. I'll find the automatic transmissions playlist. I hope you gained something out of this video. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment. Otherwise, I'll see you later. Thank you.